We want to continue in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, which we find in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Matthew 5. And we're working our way consecutively and expositorily through each and every verse and paragraph which we find in this precious sermon of our Lord Jesus. And I want to read the verses 27 through 30, which is the text that we'll be looking at both today and also next Lord's Day. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. I have to be honest, brethren, that if it weren't for the discipline of expository preaching, I'm not so sure that I would be jumping up and down for joy to preach this particular text. It's somewhat uncomfortable to preach. But if we don't preach it, we're being unfaithful to the scriptures that speak very much about this subject. And if we don't preach it, if we don't consider what our Lord's teaching is here, we're ignoring a monstrous elephant in our living room. A huge subject, which, of course, seems even more poignant in our day than even in the day in which Christ spoke these words. Consider. Back then. People wore robes that covered everything. I'm quite sure that Jesus did not see someone wearing a bikini in his day. They wore robes. There were no magazines, no billboards, no cameras, no movies, no Internet, no television, no radio. And yet, even without all of those things, those provoking things that provoke us to think of unclean thoughts. Yet Jesus found it necessary to treat this subject because it has been a subject which has plagued mankind since the beginning, since the fall. But I'm saying all of that because if the Lord Jesus Christ and all of the apostles included emphasized this subject to such a degree in such a day in which they lived, How much more ought we to take these things seriously to ourselves? We live in a very visual society. We live in a time when there are untold temptations all around. We live in a time when we have people wearing less clothing than they've ever thought to wear in the past. Pornography is readily available. Lewd behavior is on the rise and even celebrated. Perversion is celebrated in the streets, and some of you may have watched the news yesterday declaring this parade that's going to be happening soon. People's homes have become private X-rated theaters, either through the television or through movies or through the Internet. And it's opened up a brand new river of filth that flows into the homes of millions of people. Now, if what Jesus had to say in those days was very important, how much more important is it for us today who are barraged and surrounded by those things that are constantly tempting us and calling upon us to think upon things that are unclean? We live in a sex-obsessed society, do we not? Advances in technology have been wonderful in some sense, but... A curse in another sense. And so, brethren, uh, this is not a comfortable subject. I'm going to be using that three-letter word that I've already used. And I hope that I will be able to say things in such a manner that won't be offensive to you or to the children here. But let's not ignore the big elephant that's in the living room. It's there. It's a subject which needs to be dealt with and not ignored. We have here in the words of our Lord, as well as in all the paragraphs in this chapter, a reality check. The world 
lives in its own make-believe world. It lives in a world of, of fantasy. They don't, people in the world don't live in the real world. The world says that you are the Lord of your own sex life. That's not the real world. God says, no, I am the Lord of your sex life. And you have people saying, well, what does God have to do with sex? Which, of course, is a completely asinine question. That's like saying, what does Thomas Edison have to do with light bulbs? God created sex. And I don't know about you, but when you buy something from the store that comes with an instruction manual, don't you think you ought to read the instructions from the person who invented the product to know how the product is to be used? Who better than God himself to listen to when it comes to these issues? He knows what he's talking about, and he doesn't impose his laws and his rules upon mankind to restrict them or to harm them, but to do them good. The world says that sex outside of marriage is not only natural, it's just fine. It's wonderful. It's fun. Just as long as you don't get hurt physically. Make sure you're protected. Who cares about sinning against God? Who cares about sinning against your own soul? Who cares about sinning against another human being? Just as long as you don't get a transmitted disease. That's the important thing. That's the world of make-believe. In reality, God says that sex within marriage is good and virtuous, but to commit sex, to have sexual relations outside of marriage is not only a sin, but it's harmful both to you and to others and to society. The world promotes and provokes sinful lust. The world thinks it's fun or it's funny. More and more words are being co-opted by the impure mind so that it's hardly possible to say anything these days that a man of, of perverted thoughts will not teehee and think you said something sexual. But God calls this wickedness. What we have here is a reality check. And our Lord Jesus Christ says, you've heard it this way, I tell you this. And we need to realize that the world says it this way and that way. We hear it all the time, all throughout the week. We're surrounded by it. We can't help but be influenced by it. Our consciences become numb to it. We need to come back to a passage like this time and time again to get a dose of reality. Now, the way in which I want to approach this text is by dealing with it both today and also next Lord's Day. We have here four verses, and I only want to look at the first two this morning, and then we'll look at the last two, which are one of the, contain some of the hardest words that Jesus ever spoke. What does he mean by gouging out an eye? What does he mean about cutting off an arm? What is all of that about? Well, we'll deal with that next Lord's Day. But we want to look at verses 27 and 28 today, and the way in which we want to do this is very familiar to you all. First of all, by asking the question, what is Jesus not saying in these words? And then asking the question, what is he saying? By considering what he's not saying, we will at the same time be gaining a clearer understanding of what he is saying. So we're not just erecting straw men in order to chop them down, but have no relevance to the text. You'll see what I mean as we proceed. But let's read those two verses once again. Verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What is Jesus not saying in these words? I want to point out seven things that Jesus is not saying. The first thing he is not saying is that the seventh commandment, which is you shall not commit adultery. He is not saying that the seventh commandment is deficient. Remember last week we looked at the subject of the sixth commandment, how Jesus said, you have heard that it has been said you shall not murder. Jesus wasn't finding fault with the Ten Commandments. He wasn't finding fault with the sixth commandment. He wasn't overthrowing the law. 
even in this case, when he says, you have heard of old that it has been said you shall not commit adultery, he is in no way <clears throat> disparaging that commandment. He is in no way undermining it. He is in no way suggesting that the seventh commandment wasn't sufficient. It has always been sufficient. Rather, he is pointing to their incomplete understanding of that commandment. They understood the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, to be a purely external thing. As long as I don't physically kill someone, then I am clean of all offense. In the same manner, under the pharisaical regime of their day, they thought that the seventh commandment was being truly obeyed just as long as I did not actually physically in the body commit adultery with another man's wife. Their understanding of the law of God was almost entirely external. So Jesus is not undermining the seventh commandment. Rather, he is amplifying the seventh commandment. He is opening up what it truly means, both in its letter and in its spirit. To the Jewish person of that day, however, with their pharisaical understanding of this commandment, this was a conveniently narrow definition of sexual sin. By making it completely external, that was very convenient, wasn't it? Everything was so cut and dry. You're either an adulterer or you're not an adulterer. And if you are an adulterer, then you're in trouble. And what that led to was a smugness, a conceit, a pride, a self-righteousness. I haven't committed that sin. And brethren, I tell you now that wherever there is a low view of God's law, there is self-righteous pride and conceit and a quickness to be harsh in our judgments. Let us be careful that we don't duplicate the sin of the Pharisees and think that because I haven't committed that sin, that we are better than others because, as Jesus teaches here, the seeds of this sin are in our hearts and we've already committed that sin in our hearts before the eyes of a holy God. Jesus is not undermining the seventh commandment, nor is he raising the bar as if he's giving them a new commandment. Don't listen to those teachers today that say that Jesus brought some new law. He didn't bring any new law at all. He just reinforced the old one and cleared away all the garbage that was surrounding those laws through the traditions of men. Jesus was not raising the bar. He's simply declaring the standard that has always been. In fact, any Jew listening to Jesus preaching on this occasion should have known better. Jesus could have said to them, you do err not knowing the scriptures. Because, as our brother Rick has already pointed out today, what does the Tenth Commandment say? You shall not covet, which is an internal thing, your neighbor's wife. Could anything be more plain? How could they have externalized the Seventh Commandment when the Tenth Commandment only came by and said, you must not even desire in your heart your neighbor's wife. More than just an external thing. How could they have ignored the passages in the Old Testament, such as Job's words in Job 31, where he says, If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or I have lurked at my neighbor's doorway, may my wife grind for another and let others kneel down over her, for that would be a lustful crime. He himself acknowledges that sin begins in the heart, that adultery begins with the thoughts. He says also in the same chapter, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? If my step has turned from the way, or my heart followed my eyes, or if any spot has stuck to my hands, let me sow and another eat and let my crops be uprooted. He calls a curse down from heaven upon him. He has made a covenant with his eyes because he knows that adultery begins with the mind and with the heart. Even David the psalmist says in Psalm 119, Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. Vain pursuits begin with vain imaginations. How could the Jewish people of Jesus' day miss this? They missed the verse in Proverbs where it says, Guard the heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. 
as a person thinks within himself, so is he. There's so much internalism in the Old Testament that there was no excuse for the Pharisaical externalism in Jesus' day. No excuse. Jesus is in no way raising the bar. It had always been there, and he's not calling the seventh commandment deficient. Well, enough of that. Let's go on to the second thing that Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that sexual thoughts and actions are in themselves wicked. He is not saying that sexual thoughts and actions are in themselves wicked. This is something we need to say to clarify because there has been a mistake made by many. Those throughout church history who have been influenced perhaps by Gnosticism, which has this basic foundational belief that things that are physical are inherently evil. Or perhaps there has been the influence of of what has been commonly called Victorianism, where the idea that sexual relations is a dirty thing, it's a subpar thing. If you really want to please God and if you really want to be pure, you'll never engage in that. You'll never get married. You'll remain celibate for the rest of your life. As if there's something inherently bad about sexuality and sexual thoughts and actions in themselves. Now, it's true that in the Word of God, there's much emphasis given to the sins that take place in the realm of sexuality. We are all too familiar with verses like 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals will enter the kingdom of God. We're very familiar with verses like that. But let us not go away from that like so many others have done and think that therefore sexuality is a bad thing in God's sight. It's only bad when it is not within the parameters of marriage. The Bible clearly teaches that God created man, both male and female, and the first command that he gave them was that they have sex. Be fruitful and multiply. What is that? God approves of it within the marriage relationship. In Proverbs chapter 5, husbands are instructed to be exhilarated always with the wife of their youth. If you read the context, it's in a sexual context. The whole book of Song of Solomon is given over to the celebration of sexual relations within the marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul the Apostle teaches that far from sex being dirty or sinful... It's actually sinful not to have sex within the marriage relationship. Now, I understand I've used that three-letter word now several times, and I trust that it won't be offensive to you or to your children. The author to the Hebrews tells us that the marriage bed is undefiled. So let's get it through our minds once and for all, that in marriage, sex is blessed, approved of God. Not sinful. It can be done to the glory of God, believe it or not. And some people struggle all their lives, even after they're married, with these hidden thoughts or feelings that there's something evil associated with it. Not within the God-ordained institution of marriage. And I would emphasize this point this morning by saying this. That Jesus is not condemning lust in this passage. Be very careful that you make that distinction as well. He's not forbidding lust. He's forbidding lust for someone other than your spouse. In fact, the very word lust that's used here is the Greek word epithumia. It's used in the Bible both in a negative way and in a positive way. If any man lusts after the office of bishop, he lusts after a good thing. It's the same Greek word there, epithumia. And let me tell you now, men, if you lust after your wife, you lust after a good thing, and that is a good thing. Jesus is not forbidding lustful thoughts or desires as long as they are channeled toward the one whom God has given to you in marriage. He is forbidding a certain kind of lust, an illegitimate lust, A lust which not only breaks the seventh, but also the tenth commandment in not being content with the wife of your youth. 
Now, in the third place, we can also say that Jesus does not mean that we are forbidden to see, acknowledge, or appreciate other people's looks, gifts, or graces. He's not saying that it's wrong for us to see, acknowledge, or appreciate other people's good looks, or gifts, talents, or graces, or personality. He's not forbidding us to acknowledge that or to even admire that to a certain point. How often in the Bible do we find someone being described as physically beautiful, both men and women? Read the Old Testament and you'll see Joseph was very, very handsome. There's an emphasis laid on that. And then there's an emphasis laid on all of the, the, the very beautiful women like Rachel and others, Bathsheba in the Old Testament. There's an emphasis on that physical beauty, but not in a sinful way, in a realistic way, because God has built within each and every one of us a sense for the aesthetic. There is a commonality amongst all of humankind that somehow we know by instinct what is ugly, what is fair. What is beautiful? That's God given. It is not wrong to acknowledge that someone is a beautiful person, either physically or their personality, or they have gifts and talents, and you admire that person. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's like going into someone's home and you admire their house. I admire the way you've decorated this place. I admire the situation of your home. There's nothing wrong with admiring it, complimenting it, thinking upon it, getting ideas from it. When you cross the line is when you begin to covet your neighbor's house. That's when you cross the line. But there's a difference between admiring something and coveting something for yourself. The same is true with coveting your neighbor's wife. There's a difference between saying, I admire that person. As far as godliness goes, they shine like the stars. As gifts and graces go and, and talents, they, they, they have such a way about them and their personality. And they, they're very attractive. There's nothing wrong with noticing that in one another. Men to women, women to men, men to men, women to women. The line is crossed when we begin to lust in our heart and covet in our heart for that person. Now, I say that in a cautious way because you need to be careful too much attention on one person other than your spouse. Too much admiration, too much pondering on a person's attractiveness can very easily nudge you over that line. So be careful. But let's draw that distinction. In the fourth place, Jesus is not speaking of unexpected and unavoidable exposure to sexual temptation. He's not, he's not forbidding a person to unexpectedly, by no fault of his own, be confronted with temptation. Did Joseph sin when Potiphar's wife confronted him and lured him and maybe even pulled on his arm and drug him into the room? Was Joseph sinning when the temptation came upon him? No, that temptation will come upon you. And Jesus is not forbidding the very event of temptation. He's forbidding crossing over and giving in to that temptation, either physically or even in the mind. Let's face it. We live in a day when we're bombarded with images and suggestive speech that would constantly tempt us to think impure thoughts which eventually lead to impure deeds. I can't even go to the grocery store, can you? Without seeing a cover on a magazine, without seeing people immodestly dressed, without hearing pop songs that glorify illegitimate sex, movie posters, internet pop-ups and advertisements. By no fault of your own, you're going to be confronted with these temptations. Those in themselves don't constitute sin. That is, you're not necessarily sinning by seeing something. 
It's by the second look. It's by looking. It's by gazing. It's by pondering. It's by meditating. It's by parking on that particular thing that you saw. That is where the sin lies. In fact, the very word that Jesus uses here is a present participle. The word to see. It doesn't mean something that you happen to see in a moment's time. It's something that you gaze upon with the purpose of lusting. That is what Jesus is addressing here. David, for example, was not at fault when he saw Bathsheba bathing. Now, if he had been lurking at his neighbor's door, that would have been wrong because he had no business being there. But he was in his own palace. He was uh, up on the rooftop getting a breath of fresh air. And he happened to see her. Now, if he had stopped there, if his eyes had bounced, like all men should practice bouncing eyes, they ought to see something and bounce away and ask the Lord to give them a better thought. If he had done that, he would not have sinned. It wasn't a sin for him to see it. And all of these preachers who try to uh, get blood out of a turnip in that per- particular text to say that David was sinning because he wasn't with his soldiers. I don't, I don't think so. If anything, David should have been with his wife at that time. Nevertheless, he did not sin in seeing Bathsheba. What Jesus is speaking of here is the person who intentionally looks upon an object or a woman with the purpose of lusting. He's speaking of the person who watches X-rated movies, who looks at magazines that are calculated to stir up lust, who purposely go where there are sexually arousing things, either verbally or visually. He's speaking of those who look at Internet pornography as a way of satisfying their sexual desires. He's referring to people who stare at bodies, young men who go through the malls and all they think about and all they talk about are girls' bodies. I know this. You might ask me, how do I know that? Just figure it out on your own. (laughs) And I witnessed it too. Those who spend time sexually fantasizing about this or that person. That's That's what he's referring to. Not the unavoidable, unexpected exposure to sexual temptation. There's no sin in that. Now, in the fifth place, we need to say that Jesus is not saying that only adulterous thoughts, per se, are wrong. He's not saying that only adulterous thoughts are wrong. And what I mean by that, someone might say, well, Jesus doesn't mention fornication here. He only mentions adultery. So this must be something that only applies to married people. If you're married, don't lust after someone else's wife. This is, see, Jesus is talking about adultery. He's not talking about fornication. That is, impure sex outside of marriage. He's only referring to marriage, and that's really all that the Seventh Commandment applies to. I'm sorry, you're wrong. All of the commandments in Scripture that forbid us to engage in fornication, flow out of the principle and the spirit and the essence of the seventh commandment. Because the seventh commandment is all about the sanctity, the sacredness of the marriage relationship. And whether it's a sin that attacks marriage from within the marriage, or whether it's a sin that attacks the sanctity of marriage outside of the marriage, it is nevertheless forbidden by the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment forbids all sexual impurity because all sexual acts outside of marriage undermine the marriage relationship. Consider this. Those who fornicate are stealing and being unfaithful to their spouse-to-be. And they're giving away that which only belongs to that special person to someone who is not that person. So whether you're doing it after the fact of marriage or before the fact of marriage, you are undermining the marriage relationship. And think how silly it is for someone to say, well, the seventh commandment doesn't deal with fornication. It only deals with adultery. That's like the person going into the Louvre, the the museum where all of these famous and beautiful pieces of art are hanging on the wall. And there's a sign that says, do not touch or mar or otherwise hurt or damage these paintings. 
And the person might say, well, okay, I'll make sure I don't do that. But uh, I think I'm going to put a little graffiti in between the paintings. I'm going to start spray painting all around wherever there's not a painting. Do you think that that would be tolerated? Do you think that that person understood the spirit of the law? The spirit of the law is this is a sacred place. Don't do anything that would mar it. And in the same way, the seventh commandment is a category of sin under which falls many other sins. Don't be so narrow and superficial of the law of God. Now, in the sixth place, we can say this, that Jesus is not saying that only men are vulnerable to or held accountable to this for this sin. He's not just addressing men, although it's most likely, number one, that more men were in attendance to this sermon than women, most likely. And it's also uh, helpful to recognize the fact that in terms of sexual thought life, at least I was able to say this ten years ago with some conviction, but things have changed somewhat. But it seems as though history proves out that men struggle with that more than women. That may be true. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Jesus is not just addressing men here. He's addressing women as well. Women and men together. When the Tenth Commandment says, Thou shalt not covet, Is that addressed to everyone or just to men? Because he goes on to say, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. Well, then it must only address men. No, it addresses everyone. And I think it would be appropriate here to say a couple of things with respect to women. Women may not be as visually stimulated as men and therefore may not have as much of a struggle with temptation. I I may be speaking out of school here. Maybe there's a lot more going on than I'm aware of. I'm sure there is. But nevertheless, it seems as though men are more visually stimulated, women are not. But nevertheless, think about how women do sin against the Tenth Commandment and the Seventh Commandment. Maybe not in imagining all of the things that a man would imagine, but perhaps getting so caught up in a soap opera or in a romance novel that she begins to wish that she had a different husband than she does have. Begins to look at another man who is a very good and godly husband and begins to wish, oh, I wish I could be married to that kind of person. Is that not spiritual adultery right there? Mental infidelity? Think of all the ways in which women may be inclined to provoke men to think thoughts they ought not to think. It's one thing to make yourself attractive. It's another thing to make yourself seductive. God holds accountable not just the perpetrator of the sin, but the provoker of the sin. Dressing immodestly. You can conveniently say, well, I can't help it. What men think, it's their fault. I'm afraid that that is not true. It's true that it's men's fault. No question. And they are not able to blame you for their sin. Nevertheless, God will hold you accountable, too, for provoking. Therefore, women do have a very real part, though maybe not in exactly the same way, in this prohibition by our Lord Jesus Christ. If you say, well, I'm going to dress popularly because I have to keep up with the fashions. Sisters, if dressing popularly and keeping up with the fashions means you have to dress immodestly, then I think you know what you need to do. Jesus, in this very same passage, is talking about getting rid of an eyeball. Cutting off an arm and you're not willing to give up a fashion for the sake of modesty. Welcome to the Christian life and self-denial. Now, in the seventh place, Jesus is not saying that only the sex act, real or imagined, constitutes adultery. He's not just pointing to the ultimate expression of sexuality and saying that constitutes adultery, whether you've done it physically or in your mind. He's not saying that. 
Notice he says, if any man looks at a woman to lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, the act of adultery in the mind has already happened before he even looks because it's the adulterous heart that leads him to look and to feed upon the subject, the object of his eyes. And so, do not think you can escape this particular exhortation of our Lord by saying, well, I'm not actually engaging in any ultimate sexual act in my mind with this person. (coughs) Therefore, it doesn't constitute adultery. Yes, it does. Because Jesus forbids lusting, not just a particular aspect of lust, but all lusting after a person in a sexual manner who is someone other than your spouse. And don't any of you teenagers think that just because you're not fornicating, just because you're not going through with the ultimate expression of sexuality with someone, that you haven't committed fornication, either physically or in your mind, because all of the things, all of the things that have to do with your sexuality, both in your mind and in your body, are considered by God to be under the same category. He holds you accountable for this. Now, we have very little time left to consider what Jesus is saying in these words. We've looked at seven things he's not. But what is he saying? Well, we've really already said it. But we want to just capsulize it in two uh, two parts. First of all, he's saying that sexual impurity begins in the heart, begins in the mind. Sensual sins are preceded by sensual fantasies. Nobody who falls into an act of fornication or adultery just happened to fall. They fell because somewhere along the line, there were thoughts that were left unchecked. Thoughts that were left unmortified. And one thing leads to the other. The other thing that Jesus is saying here is that mental infidelity leaves one completely guilty. Here's where we need to be reminded of what Jesus said in another place. He said, out of the heart, murders, fornications, adulteries, lies, and thefts come. That's what he said. Which, in reality, is saying this. We are not adulterers because we commit adultery. We are adulterers because that is our heart and the nature of our heart. Our sinful, corrupt hearts are adulterous, and that is why we commit adultery either in the mind or in the action. Out of the heart flow these things. Now, if that's the case, then we need to realize that the law of God is not just requiring us to do certain things and to avoid other things. The law of God is commanding us to be a certain kind of person, a certain kind of person which none of us are. The law of God is commanding us to be pure in our very hearts, not just in keeping down all those filthy things that come out of our hearts, but to actually have a clean and pure heart. Now, who has a clean and pure heart? Raise your hand. We're reminded, therefore, that by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. You cannot keep the law of God, not by this standard. Cannot keep it, because even if you were to try to keep it, you've still got a filthy heart, and whatever comes out of that heart, no matter how good it appears to you, is considered filthy rags to God. That's why the Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. So be reminded of that fact, that Jesus is giving to us his holy law, and he doesn't accommodate his law To our fallenness, he tells it like it is and leaves everyone guilty before him. Now, I want to conclude with a couple of comments to those of you who are not Christians and to those of you who are. First of all, to the non-Christian. To the one here today who's not repented, perhaps is living not just in a world of thought life, but living in a sinful, real world of wickedness, fornication, and adultery. Perhaps. 
I want to address those of you who have not turned from your sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. I would say two things. The first thing I would say is fear. Be afraid. Be afraid. There's really no reason for you to smile today. And there's no reason for you to be happy today. None. You may get happy about what you eat for lunch today. You may get happy about the soft, comfortable pillow you put your head on at night. But really, if you saw things the way they really are, you would not be able to be happy. Fear, because God not only knows every single perverted thought you've ever thought, He holds you accountable, and He's storing up wrath for each and every offense against Him to be poured out on you on the day of wrath. And His wrath is even now. You might not see it, but it's right over your head, and it's abiding on you. And He may choose at any moment to disencumber His ground with your body. And take you without notice. And then judgment. The other thing I would say though to you. Because I would never leave you with just that. Fear but also flee. When John the Baptist preached to sinners like you and like me. He was preaching to uh, people who were extortioners. People who were prostitutes. People who were uh, dealing in these kinds of sexual sins of society. He was preaching to those kinds of people. And what did he tell them? He said, flee from the wrath to come. And where are they supposed to go? Are they supposed to run around in circles? No, he directed them to the one to whom they should flee. To the Lamb of God who takes away sin. They are to flee to the one who has the words of eternal life. They are to flee to the only one who offers forgiveness of sins. The Lord Jesus Christ. There's a fountain of pollution in our hearts, but God has opened a fountain for sin and uncleanness for sinners. And those who go to Christ, repenting of their sins, asking Him for forgiveness, are cleansed by Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ shed His blood on behalf of sinners just like that. Even the most vilest of sinners. I think of the passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 where Paul is listing some of the lifestyles that are condemned by God. And then he says to those Corinthians, he says, and such were some of you. Some of you were fornicators. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you were effeminate, denying your sexuality in a sense. Some of you were homosexuals. But now you have been washed And so I say to you, are you a fornicator today? And guess what? You are. If not in physical, you are mental. Are you an adulterer? Are you a homosexual? You can be washed. The Lord Jesus Christ will wash you of all of that. Not just wash you in terms of your guilt, which is an amazing thing alone, but wash your conscience so that you will know that you've been washed And you will be able to serve God from a clean conscience. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I would say to Christians, because what needs to be said to non-Christians is different, somewhat, somewhat, than what needs to be said to Christians. To Christians who have already come to Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, who have received from Christ a new heart that now longs for righteousness, I would say two things. Number one. Be humbled and amazed. Be humbled and amazed. By the standard of the moral law of God, which we've heard today, we're all adulterers. And even after we've come to Christ, we continue to sin, both in our words, our deeds, and in our thoughts. And this realization ought to humble us, deliver us from self-righteousness, Deliver us from that smug, conceited attitude that the Pharisees had. Realizing that if I see this sin and debauchery in the world all around me, I know that it's in me too. And it's only by the grace of God that I am not permitted to pursue sin with all of my being as these others are. It should be amazing to you, not only that God should save you and forgive you, considering all of the filth, Of your heart. 
But it should amaze you that he that he continues to keep you. When your sins are much more heinous now than they ever used to be before you were a Christian, because now you're sinning against greater light and greater love. And you're grieving the Holy Spirit to boot who dwells within you. It should amaze you that the Lord Jesus Christ would keep you. Think about this, men. There are thoughts that go through your mind, voluntary or involuntary, that if you were to reveal them, if God were to reveal them to your spouse and to your children and to the brethren here, they would disown you. They would disown you. Be honest. But Christ will not disown you. Be amazed. Be amazed at that. And I close with this word to Christians. Guard your heart. For out of it flow the issues of life. Sexual impurity begins in the thought life. If a man falls outwardly, it's only because he has set himself up for a fall a while ago by not guarding his heart. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? Make a covenant with God. Make a covenant with your eyes. A person who is filled with lust and adultery and pursues that unchecked, what does he do? He plans ahead. He plans ahead how he might be in a situation where he can have that lust gratified. He thinks in advance. Well, in the same way, the godly man is to think in advance. He's not to just wait for the moment of temptation to all of a sudden guard and gird himself for that trial. He is to think in advance. He is to make a covenant beforehand with his eyes. It's too late to make a covenant with your eyes when you're in the throes of temptation. Start building those walls, as we've mentioned before. Those walls against temptation before temptation overtakes you. Pray with the psalmist. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity and revive me in thy ways. Establish thy word to thy servant as that which produces reverence for thee. Flee youthful lusts. Guard your heart. Well, brethren, I hope that that is a timely reminder. I don't see how it couldn't be a timely reminder because it seems as if we could be Reminded of this every week and continue to struggle with the same thing over and over again. Next Lord's Day, we're going to look at the other two verses that follow these where Jesus speaks in a very metaphorical manner, but in a way that needs to be taken seriously concerning how we might do battle with these sins of the heart and of the thought life. May God bless this study to our own sanctification and to revealing our true hearts to ourselves, that we might see our need of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that your word is completely honest with who we are. We thank you for revealing your holiness to us, even in the Ten Commandments. And through the teaching of our Lord, we understand more and more of what those commandments entail. We stand completely guilty before you. In many ways, we have offended all of your commandments. Which makes us, Lord, all the more aware of the fact that we, on our own, are lost and undone. And so we thank you for the promise and the hope of the gospel. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin but who was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ's blood, which is a fountain to sinners, not only cleansing them from the guilt of their sin, but even from a guilty conscience. And the power is provided for those who trust in you to fight against sin, that it might not have dominion over us. We thank you for all of these blessings which flow from the cross. We pray that all here would understand these things, that you would shake us to our very boots and those of us who are hardened in sin. May these words bring conviction. May the Holy Spirit show them their need to flee to the Savior. 
We pray, Lord, that you would sanctify your people and cause us to be more and more holy in this increasingly wicked generation. Help us to guard our hearts. Help us to put a double guard on our eyes and our ears and all those gates that go into our soul that would tempt us to sin. We pray, Lord, that you would help us by your grace and your strength to resist the devil and to mortify the deeds of the body unto your glory. We pray, Lord, that you would dismiss us now with your blessing and cause these things to be kept and to bear fruit in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.